Okay. Yes. I know. All right. Go. Eric Hoffer, an American writer, once said, what monstrosities would walk the streets for some people's faces as unfinished as their minds? Good afternoon. My name is Isabella Rios, and I'm a ninth, almost 10th grader here at Da Vinci Science High School. The quote you just heard is one of my favorites because, although quite morbid, it touches upon a sort of goal of mine, to have a mind that I'm proud of, not just one that knows, but one that understands. Although the development of the mind is a lifelong endeavor, I am confident that my schooling here at Da Vinci will assist me well in reaching this goal. In fact, I'm about to show you a bit of proof, what I learned in my first year and why I should move on to the next grade. My polygon portfolio in geometry, my poetry portfolio in English, and my Be Heard, Be Heard project in physics clearly demonstrate that I've attained sufficient master in order to advance my education. The significance of this lies in the fact that a meaningful education, coupled with the genuine effort of the student, brings about a sound and solid mind. First and foremost, I will demonstrate my mastery, I will demonstrate the knowledge I attained in my geometry class. I will be presenting my mastery in essential skill number seven, which states I can calculate the perimeter, circumference, and area of any polygon or circle. During this unit, I studied just that, the specific properties of, of multiple-sided polygons and circles. I also studied the equations essential to discovering perimeter, the distance around a straight-edged polygon, area, the measure of the space within a shape, and circumference, the distance around a circle. To demonstrate my mastery in this essential skill, I put together an advertisement of the sorts for the business I was developing in English at the time. The requirement was that almost every shape in the advertisement be a certain shape. For example, the body of the boat was a trapezoid, and the cloud in the sky, you can see in the corner there, is a decagon. Upon completion of my advertisement, I took measurements and calculated the area and circumference, uh, the area and perimeter and circumference when necessary of each and every shape. Uh, I compiled my findings into a polygon portfolio, as you can see here. Uh, though, in order for me to complete this deliverable, it was essential that I learned all there was to know about the three measurements, perimeter, area, and circumference. I'll give a summary source of each one. Now, for perimeter, uh, each, e each polygon has its own equation, but the ideas are uh, yeah, prin the same principles are followed. The length of each side is measured, and then all the side lengths are added together to measure the distance around the shape. For example, the equation for the perimeter of a rectangle is P equals 2 times L plus W, where P is perimeter, L is length, and W is width. I'll use the mast of my boat from my advertisement. The length of this rectangle is 11.45 centimeters, and the width of this rectangle is 0.6 centimeters. When we plug those numbers in, we get a perimeter of 24.1 centimeters. This can also be seen as 11.45 plus 11.45 plus 0.6 plus 0.6 equals 24.1 centimeters. Now, for area, things are a little less straightforward than perimeter, whereas perimeter is one-dimensional and is measured in linear units like inches, meters, and miles. Area is two-dimensional and instead is measured in square units like square inches, square meters, and square miles. If perimeter is the length of fence we have surrounding our garden, area is the size of the garden we have inside. For example, we use this trapezoid that I've taken from one of my polygon quizzes. Uh, from one of my polygon quizzes. Uh, the equation for the area of a trapezoid is A equals 1 half times B1 plus B2 times H, where A is the area, B is base, and H is height. If we plug in a base of 11 inches, a base of 4 inches, and a height of 8 inches, uh, we get a, an area of 60 inches, but we don't stop there. In area, we score our measurements, so the correct answer would be 60 inches squared. The same rule applies for, other, for the equations of other polygons. Now, circumference is only used with circles. Since a circle is completely round and has no straight edges, the regular rules of perimeter don't apply. And so we have to use this equation to find the distance around the circle. Now the equation for circumference is c equals pi d, where c is the circumference of the circle, and d is the diameter of the circle or the distance across the circle. Uh, if our diameter is 20 feet and we multiply 20 feet by 3.14, we get an average of 62.8 feet. Like perimeter, circumference is one dimensional and so our answer does not need to be squared. As I've shown, all three of these measurements are correctly portrayed in my polygon portfolio. I believe the evidence that I've presented clearly demonstrates my mastery in my geometry class. Next, I'll speak to you about my mastery in my English class. I'll be discussing essential skill number nine, which states I can craft a well-written thesis. I will also be discussing essential skill number 10, which states I can craft well-written commentary that includes an introductory phrase, a quotation, a citation, and thoughtful comments about the meaning of the quote. Now, uh, put simply, a thesis statement is in a sentence stating a work, an observation, and finally an inference combined with an arguable opinion derived from this inference. Uh, in an essay, this sentence is the driving force of your writing. Now in English, over the course of five weeks or so, I read and analyzed several poems and songs. I would, go, I would read the work, discuss it along with the class, and take notes in the form of annotations, and finally I would explicate the poem. In short, to explicate a poem is to, um, is to critically examine each of its individual components 
and then use an observation inference method of thought in order to extract meaning and interpret meaning of the poem in the intentions of the author. These poems, along with their annotations, it's a good picture, I drew that. Um, <laughs> these poems, <laughs> along with their annotations, notes, and typed explications were compiled into a collection called My, Poly My Poetry Portfolio. Uh, you guys like your portfolios. Um, now, in these explications, I would follow a basic format. I would first, um, I would first focus on a literary device like tone, uh, auditory and cognitive effects, or patterns. And then, uh, usually, this device is pointed on annotations. <laughs> you like that, huh? Usually, <laughs> 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 this device is pointed on annotations. I would then write a thesis statement, uh, spotlighting the device and pointing out uh, the. In, I would then write a thesis statement, spotlighting the device and creating an inference based on the information that I gathered. For example, one of the poems I explicated was tonight I can write by Pablo Neruda. As you can see, I highlighted two lines of the poem and I wrote down my thoughts, which say, the repetition of the phrase in the distance highlights the fact that his happiness is also in the distance, possibly stolen, stolen by someone else. Now, while this crude remark does point out something, it does not explain its importance. My thesis statement reads as such. By looking at tonight I can write by Pablo Neruda, it is evident he uses repetition of sentences in sentence format to bring light to certain phrases and ideas. This is important because this repetition allows easily overlooked phrases, thank you, uh, to add to the overall melancholic loss of tone of the poem. As you can see, I defined the work I was examining, specified a quality of this work, and finally explained why this quality is important, why, this, why the author inserted this quality into his poem. Now, um, of course, this thesis statement can be improved by removing the basic level outline words. A higher level thesis would read as such. The poem Tonight I Can Write by Pablo Neruda makes it clear that the repetition of sentences and sentence structure is used to bring light to certain phrases and ideas. Consequentially, this repetition allows easily overlooked phrases to add to the overall melancholic loss of tone of the poem. So now we've got ourselves a, a good, strong thesis statement. Here's where the next component of an explication comes into play. First, we focus on a literary device, which in this case is a pattern. Second, we craft a thesis statement, which is what we just did. And third, we, quote, we actually quote the passage and give ourselves room to explain. Now, um, in my poetry portfolio, I did write commentary on these two lines that we just looked at, but it's quite a mouthful, so we'll look at it piece by piece. First, to introduce the line that I'm examining, this line is followed is, is in quotes and is followed by the surname of the author and the line number. I also explain why I'm pointing out this line, which in this case is the repetition of the phrase in the distance. Then I touch upon what I said in my thesis statement, which is that the repetition of this line is akin to the author underlining the line and saying, pay attention to this. I then give a bit of background of the point that I'm trying to make, uh, again drawing inferences from both, my, from both modern culture and what I've already read of the poem. I then describe what I believe the author is trying to communicate to us, and I throw in some sentimental ideas to complete pull together what it is that I have to say. Everything that follows the introduction of the quote is a personal interpretation that, uh, of the passage that ties in with the thesis statement that was aforementioned. Um, so there you have it. You have annotations, thesis statement, quote, and explanation. I believe that the work, I am confident that the work that I have done in my poetry portfolio is a perfect example of my mastery in my English class. I will now speak to you of what I learned in my physics class. For physics, I, just, I chose essential school number nine, which states I can describe the relationship between a magnetic field and an electric current in a straight wire and a solenoid. Now, in this unit, I learned about magnetism and electricity and longitudinal waves, and then used my knowledge to create my very own functioning speaker, which was amazing. It's a beautiful thing to me. But um, let me quickly explain just how the speaker was, uh, was put together and how it functions. Now first, on the base or bottom of the speaker, I glued a, um, a donut magnet. Now this is a permanent magnet, and this donut magnet is, is desirable over a neodymium magnet because the, elect the magnetic field of the magnet is concentrated in the center, and seeing as in a speaker we want the greatest magnetic field possible, uh, the donut magnet would be the obvious choice. Inside the permanent magnet, I also glued a copper crimp. This copper crimp, uh, it's, it doesn't really serve any function except to hold the solenoid in place. And the solenoid is a tightly wrapped, tightly looped wire that gives off a magnetic field when, it, when electricity is uh, sent through it. Now, uh, the solenoid is not attached to the base. Instead, it is attached to the diaphragm, which is a thin, lightweight, disc-shaped object. Also glued to the diaphragm are two folded pieces of paper that are act as suspension. They connect the diaphragm to the base of the speaker, and uh, they keep the speaker from falling apart. Now, in addition to all of this, the two exposed wires of the solenoid are extended, and they um, they sit outside of the speaker so that we can actually use the speaker. Now, okay. Now, now that we know how it's put together, we can begin to understand how it functions. 
So um, the way the speaker functions is two alligator clips connect the exposed wires of the solenoid to the exposed wires of a headphone jack. <laughs> to the exposed wire of a headphone jack. This headphone jack is plugged into a radio, iPod, or similar device. Now, um, this device, when, when the headphone jack is plugged in and music is played, this device sends an alternating current into the wire of the solenoid. Um, this current transforms the solenoid itself into a magnet of sorts, and it has its own magnetic field and its own uh, magnetic poles. So the alternating current <coughs> switches the poles of the solenoid so that it alternately attracts and repels the magnetic field of the permanent magnet that sits inside the speaker. Now, basic rules of magnetism say that when the direction of force that the direction of force reverses when the, the direction of the current reverses, as you can see in my, I drew that. Okay, yeah, I know. Okay. Um, it it reverses when the current reverses, and so as the current is alternating, the direction of force alternates with it, and as a result, the solenoid is moved up and down um, within the permanent magnet. Now, um, this alternating current moves the solenoid up and down, and the solenoid, since it's attached to the diaphragm moves the diaphragm up and down. Now here is where the magic or the music or whatever floats your boat happens. Um, the air surrounding the diaphragm uh, is disrupted by the movement, the vibration of the diaphragm. The air molecules around the diaphragm are disrupted and so they in turn disrupt the molecules next to it, kind of like a domino effect. And sooner or later, the, the air molecules next to our eardrums are being vibrated. These in turn vibrate our eardrums themselves. <laughs> That's Jackson. Um, <laughs> 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 These in turn vibrate the eardrums themselves. And so the brain interprets this vibration as, or this longitudinal wave as sound. Now when we look up at, back at the diaphragm, we now understand why the diaphragm, it is necessary that the diaphragm is a lightweight, thin material. Uh, Newton's second law states that the less mass an object has, the more it is able to accelerate. And in our speaker, we want our diaphragm to have maximum acceleration for optimum sound. And so as a result, it is best if our diaphragm is made of a relatively thin material. Um, so, okay, recap. Let's go back to this. Recap. Alternating current sent through solenoid. The <coughs> current interacts with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. This, the interaction forces the solenoid to vibrate. The solenoid forces the diaphragm to vibrate. And, uh, and the, it, the resulting disruption of air um, vibrates the air molecules, and these vibrate our eardrums. And in the end, this is interpreted by your ears and our brains as sound, and thus, music is heard. All of this that I just went through right now, as well as challenges and solutions that I went over in the making of my speaker, are most prevalent in my Be Heard poster. I believe that the evidence I've presented today uh, clearly demonstrates my mastery in my physics portion. My name is Isabella Rios, and I am going to be in the 10th grade this fall. Thank you for, my pres for listening to my presentation of learning. Okay, Isabella, easy. let's go back to the science portion. I go forward. Go forward. All right. Um, to clarify for me. Okay, let's try this. Why is it important that we burn the tips of the magnet wire before uh, attaching it to our... Um, audio jack. The uh, the wire is you can you can probably sort of see it. It's red right here. Uh -huh. This red is not the actual color of the wire. It's actually the insulation surrounding the wire, so that everything that the wire touches isn't automatically affected by the wire. And so, um, as a result, we have to burn the tips of the wire right there, the exposed wires. And you can't see it here. Um, if you can see it here, they're they're kind of like black and they're kind of like kind of like this. Um, this is because, like, when the metal of the alligator clip, it's so it can come straight into contact with the actual wire without having it, uh, having the insula ins insulation in the way. Okay. In, in other words, the insulation would disrupt the flow of the yes, of the electrons. Good. Um, Miss Cat, can you go back to your? Oh, actually, you know what? I I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the question. Can you draw me a trapezoid, please? Ah, the question. Okay. Uh, um, you already gave me the uh, formula, so I'm not concerned with you memorizing that. It's the one half base one plus base two times height. 
What is significant about the one half? Um, uh, this is because this is because if you go like this, it's <laughs> Uh, do I have to keep talking? You have just made nope. her extremely proud. Okay. <laughs> oh. I kind of want to hear the answer. We've heard a lot of people try to answer <laughs> this. Why don't you keep going? Yeah. Well, because the trapezoid is actually made of two uh, triangles, and they're congruent. So the area of a triangle, I believe, is um, A equals, what is it, one-half base turns height? So base turns height. So a triangle like only has one base. So you have base one, base two, and then uh, you cut it in half. I mean, because, like, yeah. you could find the specific area of each triangle, and then that's the other, and it would actually be the area of the whole. Whoop. Well, all right. Um, can I ask you a follow up question? Go no for it. I get this okay. I, 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 I'm totally following you. Okay. I get that there's two triangles, and that they have different bases, so we can distribute the base, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What is it about the height of those triangles? Like, um, Did you already answer that? Kind of. What is it about the height of those triangles that allows us to work? That allows us to work? Mm -hmm. um, they have the same height. There you go. All right. Um, Isabella, some feedback. Powerful tone and presence. Okay, I can tell. This was right off the bat. I wrote this down. I can tell this is going to be... Stop running around. <laughs> okay, we're not quite done. Okay, powerful tone and presence. I can tell this is going to be a well rehearsed and thoughtful presentation. Things I liked. Now that we understand the parts of the speaker, we can begin to understand how it functions. Okay. You went through and you described each part and you used that beginning of your presentation to address content when you spoke about that. Um, donut shaped magnet, how it concentrates the magnetic field in the center, um, how the solenoid sort of similarly concentrates the magnetic field in its center. But you didn't stop there. Once you had sort of addressed some of the skills in talking about the anatomy of the speaker, as you were, as it will, as if you will, <laughs> um, then you went on to continue to address the um, content in an explanation of how the speaker functions. Okay. You supported your claims with deep content knowledge, presented an excellent walkthrough of the speaker function, excellent, excellent use of academic language, um, and um, one thing that I was really impressed with was um, you used evidence of mastery of prior essential skills, specifically essential skill number two from last semester, um, to support your mastery of essential skill number nine. Good job. For math, I, my comments are very limited. Um, I Four words, you're absolutely amazing. That was a great presentation. You are the only person, I've only asked four students that question, but you are the only one who's gotten that one correct. Um, so I, you have no idea how happy that makes me feel. Um, <laughs> not only the academic language, but just your language in general. The, the vocabulary that you possess is wonderful. And I love hearing it because it makes you sound very professional. It also makes you sound very, very intelligent. So thank you for a wonderful presentation. All right.